the purpose of today is to talk about um, how I think this is that what neighborhood network schemes in Birmingham been a shift in the way the council um, works with community groups and works with citizens. And I just wanted to um, ask Matthew to explain um, briefly that change, how that change has come about and what it means. Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, so adult social care are, are um, you know, closely associated with neighbor networks and, and changes in how adult social care work are what sort of gave the motivation, the drive to set up neighbor networks. But I just wanted to just quickly say that that doesn't limit neighbor networks and the value of neighbor networks to what adult social care do. But at the moment, that's, that's what they're focused on. Well, no, uh, because um, that, you know, that, that because of that's where the funding comes from. So um, adult social work, um, you know, realized that its approach was, was kind of broken really. Uh, it was a very bureaucratic uh, model called care management. And what was happening was um, budgets were being cut, demand was increasing, and this very sort of bureaucratic system designed to work out whether people were eligible just didn't work because people came away, lots of people came away with nothing, but the people that did get support, it was very expensive to kind of just to do the assessments and set that up. And it was unsatisfying you know, unsatisfactory for our staff, but also for citizens too. So there needed to be a real shift in how work was done, a real shift towards prevention, but also a much, much more kind of streamlined, much more human kind of process. So there, there within um, social care, there's a strong shift towards strength-based approaches. So if you Google that, you'll find loads of information about it. Um, and Birmingham decided to uh, take on use something called the three conversations framework which is just a strength-based approach you know there are others available um, and essentially it's about it's very simple it's about cutting out loads of paperwork it's, it's the, the three conversations consist of conversation one which is listening to and connecting to people so listening really closely and listening really well to what their concerns are and what their priorities are and um, connecting them to support and not jumping straight into traditional services, but just finding out what their goals and aspirations are. And that's very strongly where the work of the neighbor networks come in because social workers just had no real knowledge of what was in communities. They become totally disconnected from them. Conversation two is about responding to people in crisis. Uh, so uh, the idea of conversation two is that you respond to that crisis and you stick with that person they, they talk about sticking with someone you know, sticking like glue to a person until they're out of crisis and when when you and being giving a flexible giving a flexible response that will, will will help take that person out of a crisis and then you come once that's done you come back to the conversation one mode which is about listening and connecting people conversation three is where someone has a need for support that can't be met through um, their own strengths and resources or through community assets or family or connection they have some uh, clear need then it's that's that's getting into sort of eligibility and long-term packages of care so that's obviously still needed and people might have a bit of both so obviously some people still need care home placements some people need home support with personal care but the neighbor network might be able to respond you know help guide them towards something that would tackle their isolation so that's kind of the strength of why that's a very quick uh kind of overview so it was the neighbor networks are really complementing and supporting the implementation of three conversations but I, I just want to repeat again i don't think it limits the neighbor networks to just thinking about that uh, uh, in the future, you know, if other people want to develop it further. Lovely. That's really helpful, Matthew. And um, in terms of the, the approach the council's taken as well, these prevention outcomes have been really key to underpinning all of that work as well, haven't they? Yeah. Yeah, so all of the NNS. So... Matthew's back to those, doesn't it? Yeah. So just very quickly, just to talk about the practicalities of neighbourhood network schemes, they're based um, 
the purpose is, is as Matthew's explained, they're based around net within the concept of the citizen in their neighborhood, working with citizens who are over 50. There are um, link workers, um, networkers, community development um, officers like uh, Tiber and like Lois in each constituency, each of the 10 constituencies in Birmingham. And they're concerned with linking with local assets, mapping, acti mapping activities and services and connecting in social work teams with all of, all of that work. And um, the complexity of Birmingham being big is uh, there are a number of partners, as you can see, a range of different community-led organisations um, in eight of the 10 constituencies and in two of the 10 constituencies, the Neighbourhood Development Support Unit from the City Council is actually the key lead there. So Matthew and I have many conversations about co-production and uh, and, and can be quite purist about it. But Matthew, um, you sent me this one um, yesterday. Do you want to explain um, where the, how this came about and why it's a Birmingham yeah. definition? Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. So in the previous role, I I worked um, for the council in term, in, with, with citizens in, in terms of uh, them being meaningfully involved in what adult social care did. So, you know, that could be about developing services, reviewing services, or in any ways, you know, in which it can be involved. And uh, at that point, we were working with, with a group of people and we were putting on um, a kind of event, which is about, it was before anyone had thought about the NNS, but an event was about accessing and finding things, you know, that help you lead a good life in the community. So the, the people working on that came up with this definition with us. Um, so that was what co-production meant to them. And that was based on their experience of working with us for a while. Um, but I think that for me, the key, when we talk lots, I mean, there's lots of meanings behind co-production, but for, in, from an adult social care perspective, it's about that sharing of power. So it's about people that often don't have a voice and don't have a lot of power. And then people like me who relatively have a lot of power and influence. It's about us, us, as paid people, professionals, letting go of some of that control and recognising the skills and expertise of people that often don't get recognised. So it's about that change of, you know, it's about working in that very different way. Um, yeah. Is that, that, is that okay, Benita? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, we will have, I hope, plenty of time for questions at the end. But um, if something isn't clear, um, you know, if we if we launch into our usual acronyms or anything like that, please just um, unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, not that's not a problem. So um, Matthew has put together um, what um, some of the building blocks are of neighbourhood network schemes, and we really we really understand that this is a very simplification and things merge and things are the, the things mesh into each other here but we're going to pick up on some of these themes and think particularly about the issue about how people's voices have been heard how the voice of the citizen influences what is done um, in 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 localities so i'm just going to go through and um pull in some examples um and and particularly um yeah give some examples and lois and uh, tiber um, shout up when there's things that you want to, to bring in. But to start with, um, the importance of what's done in, in neighbourhood network schemes is to really understand the assets, the local services, activities, organisations and people in the locality and to think about what's missing, what's missing um, to enable uh, older people to have a good life. Tiber, you've been involved in uh, this since the beginning. Um, and I know you were really involved in that first phase of, of doing the initial mapping in, in Hall Green. Do you just want to talk about how you heard, how you listened to people's voices and how getting closer to local organisations meant you had a better understanding of what was needed in Hall Green? Yes, thank you. Um, we reached out in a number of ways. I think we, as part of our mapping, um, we connected with a lot of community organisations and as well as our mapping, we were also talking to local citizens and holding networking events and micro consultations to hear the voices of the local um, communities and citizens to be able to 
shape the board, to shape the um, services um, and the offer within the community. So we felt that it's important to hold events, um, to meet with the social work teams regularly. And um, we held four community caring festivals um, across all four wards where we invited um, community groups, local citizens, assets, and um, everybody who could contribute to um, taking part in the activities and discussions around gaps, around barriers. And there was activities around um, a 3D map where people were able to um, identify on the map where they are and um, pinpoint that. So that was a very visual activity and people engaged on that very well. We also felt that um, the, ga the gaps wall and barriers walls where people were able to um, pick up post-it notes and be able to flow around the room and be able to um, put down where they felt the gaps were um, on post-it notes. Um, for us to be able to collate and uh, analyse, to be able to understand um, we are creating services and um, offers within the community that are um, in line with the voices of the local people within those wards. Thank you for that. That's a really good. Um, I said, I think a lot of good work was done in Hall Green, as in all the others, but there were some, some of the tools you used were really good. Thank you for that. So each of the constituencies, each of the neighbourhood network schemes has got a partnership steering group. Um, Lois, do you want to just uh, talk about the range of people on yours and how that means that local local voices are heard, just, just briefly? So um, what we found in Northfield is that we need to trust the assets, um, that they are having contact with um, citizens, that they know um, what their citizens are asking them for. Uh, so rather than it be a sort of top heavy, you know, it's dependent on your funding outcomes or what your funders want to see, that it is definitely, you know, what's needed in the area, what the citizens want to do, um, what the citizens need. What's really good about the steering groups is that you can get a range of assets um, and it could be a, a local community group, it could be the police, the fire service, people that are working directly with citizens day in day out that can then feed back to us what they're hearing on the ground. That means that we can then shape our gap analysis. We can find out what services are available and, and where there's there's gaps. And it's something that we could maybe um, put in place for people. And it's that real kind of partnership, getting together, having conversations, sharing conversations that have been had um, and making sure that, um, you know, we're really getting across what, what the citizens need rather than, than what we think they need. Thank you, thank you. And many of the steering groups across the city have got citizens sitting on them as well. A key part um, of the process of um, neighbourhood network schemes is the grants process. So as Lois said, the steering groups are thinking about what are the priorities, and then there's a local grants panel um, with a range of, of a huge range of grants. I think um, I think it is quite astonishing um, to see that figure of two million pounds and three hundred grants, and that's it. It's over three hundred grants because I don't think it includes the micro grants that are under the grants that are under two hundred and fifty. But basically, these, these are grants from from fifty pounds up to on the whole ten thousand pounds as as the maximum. Um, Lois. Do you want to start and then Tyba, if there's things you want to add, just to talk about um, the, again, the, how, you, how you think that local people, citizens have influence where those grants have gone. I think you've already picked it up and then maybe how they are really grassroots activity, like um, one of the ones um, I love in, in Northfield is at that top right hand um, picture. Lois, do you want to start? Yeah, so what, what's really good about NNS is that um, our outcomes are relatively broad in comparison to what some funders will be expecting from people. And that gives um, assets and workers 
the opportunity to be listening to what citizens want and need um, and therefore sort of meeting those needs. So it's that bottom up approach. Um, so a couple of examples in Northfield of how that's worked is um, throughout COVID, a lot of our coffee mornings were closed down. Um, and people were telling us that they really missed those coffee mornings, that they were really struggling without them. Um, obviously, we had the, the COVID restrictions. So that, that picture there is actually, we did a mobile coffee morning where we literally put coffee cakes in the boot um, and went from street to street and door to door and did that coffee morning, had that social interaction on doorsteps. Um, so still meeting the citizens need but within, within those restrictions. Um, something else that, that's literally come from the citizens was um, a group of citizens that were feeling a bit fed up with the uh, rubbish on the streets, um, fly tipping. So they created um, a wombling group where um, with support from, from NNS and from the councils, we're encouraging people that couldn't go out and do their usual things, but were going on daily walks instead. So to give a little bit of purpose from that, create a little bit of um, opportunity to socialise. We're doing wombling groups where they were actually um, litter picking around the local streets. Um, it's it's really blown up. We you know everywhere I go now in Northfield, I see people walking down the road in a hivies um, and a litter picker. So um, what what we mainly what I would like to say is. I've worked for many, many organisations where we work into the outcomes of the organisation. The difference in NNS and the reason I love it so much is that we're getting people that engage in on a completely different level because it's things that they've asked for. You know, only yesterday I was being told that um, the, a, a brain injury unit, what the citizens actually want to do is go fishing. Um, you know, and there's, it might be old, older gentlemen that like to go to a working men's club. And with NNS, we can support activities in a whole range of different places, um, depending on, on the wants and the needs of the citizens, rather than us telling them what they want and need. Is that okay, Benita? Yeah, thanks for that. That's really, um, I hope that that's clear to everybody else. And what about Hall Green? Again, as, uh, are there other things um, that you've done in Hall Green? Um, uh, how is it that you know that what local people need is, is what's been um, given? And one thing I haven't said is one of the key things that Neighbourhood Networks did was also take the lead in terms of coordinating activities during COVID. And again, there's an example of Hall Green in that picture. Um, as well with uh, the, the commissioning you did of, a, of the neighbourhood hub. But is there anything else, you, uh, Tyber or anyone from Tall Green wants to add? I think um, having the engagement of citizens on steering groups and on the grant funding panel has been really very, very useful. And I think it's very imperative um, for the citizens to be involved in the services being designed for older people in the local area. Um, and we have found that it has it has boosted confidence in in older people to be able to uh, ask about services and um, as such in networking events um, we launched our, our whole green communities website in, in during COVID um, and that was flagged up as a need that somewhere centrally there's no way to be able to access information um, so now that's accessible to all the networks within the constituency citizens and um, organisations um, and I think people being involved in, in the design of NNS has been very important and imperative to Hall Green um, and listening to the needs uh, and the gaps. Thank you for that, that's really helpful. I won't um, ask for an example of this at the moment, but we can come back to it in discussion. Um, one of the things that uh, neighbourhood network schemes have been doing is been developing local assets. And this is actually an example of a group of people from different organisations who've got funding in Erdington coming together 
to make sure they really understood how to capture impact and how to report back on the stories of, 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 their, of what they were going to be doing with the grants. Two more of the building blocks here are about partnerships with social workers and also networking events. And um, there's examples here from Hodge Hill of, uh, of, of working with some of the assets that came along and also Maureen, the key social worker there. But maybe Matthew as a starting point, could I bring you in? And uh, because you've been to a number of these in, in different constituencies, what is it that you think, what is it about these, these types of activities that, that reassures you that social workers are having a better understanding about what's needed locally? I mean, we, we get the, the pandemic has really kind of um, held back these uh, and, and they, they have happened online, but it's just not quite the same. But when they when, when they were happening, the feedback from social workers is really, really good. I mean, they really, really enjoy it. Um, and, you know, they also um, from the point of view of small local organisations, providers, assets, they, they, they have very limited contact with adult social work and kind of limited understanding of it. So it's been positive all round. Um, you know, adult social care is quite hidden and not, not very well understood and you know, doesn't really kind of market itself or promote itself. So it's kind of addressing some of that, but it is a big task. Um, so, so yeah, it's really positive and I'm hoping now the pandemic's coming to an end that some of these things can can restart again, um, but I, one of the th I think one of the thing one of the tricky things is the follow through and the follow up afterwards because some assets were really positive about the initial contact, but it, but disappointed that it didn't lead to the kind of links or or citizens being introduced introduced that they kind of hoped for. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I think you know. To be fair, it's it's uh, been online has a is it's much more difficult. And we haven't managed to organise like speed networking events online because um, I think that's uh, we we just haven't had the confidence that technology will work. And we have got a bit of a, a digital divide in terms of Zoom and Teams um, and different different bits of the networks uh, having having access or comfortable with that. But um, there have been some really great uh, networking events, particularly amongst ASSET online as well over this time. And we can come back to that in a, in a bit. And running, so running through everything, you can see um, that co-production, which is another specific building block, um, is, um, has, has, has been uh, an issue. And and, but some, some of the neighbourhood network schemes have also developed specific co-production groups or are developing those in order to, to hear specifically from older people around the issues around developing neighbourhood network schemes. And, um, and you know, some, some, are, some are yet to develop that. The example on the left, um, it just looks like a normal flyer to you, um, but I have to say that it was um, the, the co-production group in Sutton looked at looked at the flyer even started by taking apart the flyer and going that's no good you're not going to attract any more people and actually as soon as they put out this which was at their improved version they got a, a, a handful of people coming forward wanting to be involved um, and in um, Northfield do you want to talk about what you're what what you're doing there now Lois? Yeah so our, our older people's forum um, has um, people that live in the area from all walks of life, um, all over 50. Uh, we have people um, from the BAME community, um, LGBTQ+. We have um, people with disabilities. Um, and what's really great is the discussions that we have on there are um, what is life like for you um, and what interests you, what, what would you be interested in doing uh, and that's really helped us um, in where we, in what projects we're funding um, and it's also led to us approaching assets and saying look this is a real gap in the area, this is something that we really want to work towards, you know, can you help us? Um, 
So they're not only, um, it's, we're not just having conversations, we're not just talking about it, we're actually taking actions from the things that, that you know, are important to the people in the area uh, and, and taking those forward. That's a great example. And um, again, one of those things that I think a number of neighbour network schemes are hoping can be restarted or, or launched for the first time um, after, after lockdown eases. I think it's important to remember that um, some of the four of the 10 um, organisations only launched like four months before the lockdown came in. So um, the fact so much has been achieved has actually been quite remarkable, really. Anita, can I just add something? Yep. Um, we, as a commissioning team, we've just started to establish a co-production group to sort of support us and work with us. And that we were prompted to do that because... I guess a bit of it is, well, if we're telling NNS leads they really must do this and they need to do more of it, we should do it too. So there's a bit of that. But also the timing was right because we're we're recommissioning. So all of the NNSs are currently extended till March, uh, next, next March. But we're working on, because we have to work so far ahead, we're working on the process of recommissioning. We're hoping to recommission everything for, you know, uh, well seven years hopefully and uh so having citizens involved at the beginning of that um so that that's something we're just starting to work on but we're hoping that they'll will find ways they can meaningfully get involved in all of the all of that process all of that recommissioning and procurement and stuff no, that's really good and i know when we've done procurement before with you having citizens on that panel has been really really um useful yeah. Don't need to worry about just um just for that to say that we do frequently get all the neighborhood network leads across the city together um at the moment it's every two weeks on zoom and that helps um see where there are shared issues shared priorities as well so matthew you've already talked about co-production of the next steps so we've sped through that before i throw it open to the floor um I'm going to go Lois, Tiber and Matthew, if there's anything specific you want to add, anything um, you think has been really good around the voice of the citizen that we've not we've not um, considered just briefly. Lois? One major um, plus from having NNS in the area is that it's really linked everybody together. Um, so assets that may have um, felt disconnected from the council, disconnected from, from bigger organisations, have really felt sort of that they've been brought into the fold. Um, the knock-on effect to that has been that we're now sharing resource and, you know, it's not expected that, that, that one organisation has to do everything in order to support that citizen. And, that it, you know, it's very much we're a, we're a whole network around that one person, um, whether they need a knitting group, whether they go to a, um, a local church to do that or whether they actually need social care involvement, that we can really create that team around the person um, and just listening to their voice and it being led very much by them. That's great. Thank you. Tiber, is there anything specific else about the voice of the listening, listening to local needs, listening to local people that you want to just to bring in? Any other example? I think it's, it's important at listening, but also supporting um, some of the local needs um, of the grassroots organisations, because sometimes within the community, we have lots of organisations and we have small grassroots organisations who quite often are not constituted or unsure of how to um, become constituted. And we, what we try and encourage is to become um, to go under a host organisation or we support the organisation to become constituted um, to, to, to enable them to be able to look at what, what else is going on in the locality um, and to network and I think that's very important um, and I'm hoping that we are going to start to resume some of our networking um, online and as lockdown lifts um, I think it's important to, um, to get out and speak to the citizens and, and to ensure that the local um, needs are being uh, listened to and actioned. No, absolutely. And I think you, you mentioned the grassroots there. 
And I think I think that I'll come to you in a second, Matthew, but I think you'd agree that it's one of the been one of the benefits of of, of neighborhood network schemes for the council as well, which is managing to have that reach into those micro organizations, those very uh, local organizations that the council had no way of connecting with before before this. Um, and I think um, the micro grants as well in, in Northfield have been supportive of, of those those smaller groups, as well as enabling PPE and such like to be purchased for some of those slightly more established groups. Matthew, is there anything else um, to um, say? Am I right in thinking that uh, this helps the council reach much, much deeper into communities than you've ever been able to do before? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were starting from a really low base. <laughs> and when I, um, you know, and I, I've worked for council for quite a long time and I know that, I mean, you know, a good illustration of this, you know, when the three conversations model, they start to roll that out, you know, social socials would say, well, what, I, I get the file, I get the allocation for, you know, Mr. Smith or something. I just put his address in my sat nav and drive there. I have absolutely no idea what's between my office and his house. Absolutely no idea. So, but, it, you know, although it sounds bizarre, maybe to outsiders, it was a kind of revolutionary idea that they actually engage you know it i think we adult social has spent years disconnecting itself uh you know very effectively getting more and more disconnected um you know over, over years and years uh so you know we, we start from a very low base and and so the only way is up really uh, <laughs> um, the other thing i wanted to mention was i really like the sort of tools and techniques and I've had experience of them in a different role that Hall Green used, um, and you know the engaging, uh, fun ways of doing gap analysis sort of work. And I'd love to see more of that happening. Um, and I don't know. I I, I, did, I think I met her, but I don't know who did. I didn't go to the event, um, Tibbs, but I I don't know whether that lady's still around that does the graphic um, facilitation stuff. But she is, okay. yeah, she is. yeah. It's, it's really really good. Thank you for that. So we, um, we, we are here both to answer questions, um, but also we wanted to know, we've heard the basics of neighbourhood network schemes in Birmingham, how they've reached out to um, local older people and how they've supported um, the voluntary sector to flourish really, to support that in the neighbourhoods. But um, we also thought you might have ideas about things that we're missing, obvious things that are obvious or things that are more subtle that we're missing and examples from elsewhere um, across the, the country that maybe we should be looking at and getting new ideas from. So can I just open it up to, um, to questions and, um, and we, can, we can send these out as well because they've got our contact details um, on at the end as well, if, if that's helpful for people. But for now, um, I'll stop sharing. And um, if, if anybody wants to ask a question or to give us some advice. That's a good question. Matthew, na neighborhood network schemes are important and have made great strides with local citizens, but how will NNS build on co-production? at a strategic commissioning level and connect to the grassroots local level. So it's, a, it's linking um, up with to, the, to what you started talking about, but do you wanna say a bit more about the challenges of that, but also um, some, some of the ways you want to make that, that work um, going forward, particularly with this big commissioning piece of work that you're, you're doing at the moment? Yeah, uh, it's really difficult. Um... I think it is challenging within um, a large bureaucracy like um, Birmingham City Council to really genuinely co-produce things. And I think as an organisation, we don't often sort of acknowledge all the constraints and barriers that are in place. You know, it, I would bore you all if I talked about, you know, all the hurdles we have to like jump through. And a lot of them are sort of, totally disconnected you know from each other and from citizens and stuff so it, it's so I think I think I think it's about I mean the, we used to have like a mantra in the past when I did it you know it's about picking what's positive and what's possible so you know pick out be smart about picking things that we can achieve 
together in co-production and don't make like overblown statements about everything will be co-produced um you know it, it, it's just some things we can't you know we can't we're not we can't march into legal and say you know you need to sit down with some citizens you know that is just not gonna work and say similarly with finance you know there's some bits of how we operate that just don't make it easy so it so it's about yeah it's a long it's a slow process of showing people you know showing our colleagues and our bosses you know examples of where this really makes a difference and and i, I gradually i guess gradually trying to challenge them about so what does that mean how do we need to change you know how do we need to change because um we talked about a three conversation strength-based approach so you're seeing that happen in the front line it's not all perfect but there's some great examples but you're not seeing the same sort of mindset and methodology sort of behind the scenes in how all the other bits of the council operate you know so there's there is this disconnect um and we're a political organization which makes us complicated you know we have we can't just you know we have, we're ultimately accountable to people that are elected so yeah that kind of not really enough <laughs> but i think there's i i I think there's some, some honesty there, which is that you, you know, for you as a as a team, just mm. managing and and, and navigating mm. through legal and uh, and finance mm. is difficult enough, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Um, so it's about being clear where the parameters are. Naeem, yeah. did you want to add in, add anything back on that, or uh, add any challenges to it? Challenges welcome as well today. Hang on, uh, I'm going to start a video. Am I there? Yeah. yeah. Um, Look, I've been involved in NNS uh, even before the inception, part of the Better Care Fund. And I really am passionate about NNS. Uh, but I feel that NNS has actually, you know, it's, it's got a much greater potential of unlocking opportunities. And it's actually at a strategic level. And it's like, you know, when you've got public health, you've got the NHS, the CCGs and all different bodies but also other national programs is how somehow you can work together. There's something called the Health and Wellbeing Board, and it's been quite proactive of actually uh, running these type of schemes. But it's actually like, you know, it's like you've got a magic formula. How do we actually maximize the potential to actually make a difference at the local community? Because all the NNSs, you know, we have 10 different models, and each one is uniquely different serving communities at the local level. But it's again, it's that strategic thing. And it's not about the resources, it's about the potential assets and how they can actually benefit the stakeholders, the communities, the practitioners, so that you really do make an impact in future uh, people who are actually going to be in the 50s. And due to COVID, it's going to get worse. So we need to be mm -hmm. smarter better to actually make that difference but can i say i'm a champion of the nns and always have been and uh, i just really want to ensure that you know nns does actually have a future place but also as a strategic lead and also as a mechanism for people to have a voice mm. it's a really brilliant challenge and i think yeah. um you know one of the reasons we've been trying to you know do more presentations and such mm -hmm. like about it about NNS is to make sure that we're better known across mm. across the city and, and across the country as well um, in order to be able to make those better links and and to be to be more visible but that's that is a really good um good challenge and I think I think a starting point needs to be just really clear connections in with um with the link workers the social prescribing link workers and the, the PCNs and the, the mm. primary health I think that's yeah. something that is is is, is an achievable first step but and just one point, I don't want to embarrass Tibbs, but she has been inspirational to a lot of uh, groups that she's been working with. And, you know, without her contribution and support, a lot of the organisations during COVID wouldn't be in the kind of position they are now without the support of, uh, I would say, uh, yeah, NNS whole green, but Tibbs herself. So she's actually <laughs> taken steps outside the call of her duties. And I think that could be replicated across every single other NNS. Um, so keep up the good work. That um, is brilliant endorsement. Thank you yeah. so much for that. that is I can, really... I can say, confidently say the same about Lois as well. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Um, there's a question from Steph about timescales, which relates to what Matthew's been saying. And then I'll come to um, Lisa. 
so um, Steph's question, Matthew, is how, what is basically what is the complexity on the timeline and the horizons for co-production? And actually, for this piece of co-production you were talking about, it's quite specific, isn't it? Um, for the next for the procurement process. Yeah. So the timelines are the various parallel things. So um, we're looking, we're having to get. Um, approval for additional money because we we want to um we want to expand the work of the nns so it includes so it's doing its capacity building work to benefit um younger disabled adults so it's the kind of 18 year old to 49 year old um and that already overlaps with what the nns is doing but it's it, it's just so that the nns kind of aligns with what adult social care's responsibilities are uh, so there's getting that there's um there's we are there's all the stuff that before we go to cabinet so um kind of legal finance and stuff signing off stuff and then there's um cabinet uh, which will be in july and then the procurement process starts which you know includes sort of advertising the opportunity and then people submitting bids and so all of that and then so by april 2022 we'll have will be awarding contracts so so what are the in terms of co-production i suppose the challenges are that some of those processes aren't just just no one ever imagined citizens would sort of influence them so there are some definite opportunities so like the procurement process definitely but um some of the bits it's just they're not just designed with the idea that citizens are a part of them does that answer can, can I just come in there as well um, from obviously we you know Northfield has had an NNS scheme now for for just over 12 months mm. um, you know when when I've worked with the council before I've, I, you know not for but with and you very much how you how it would work is that you would get given this money then you'd get a visit by the uh, commissioning team or, you know, the, the managers of that project and they'd be like, right, tell us what you've done. Um, and then it would, they might say, well, you need to do this more or you haven't done that enough, etc. That's not how it works, you know, with NNS. We work really closely with, you know, with the um, commissioning team, with adult social care. And it is very much our voice is being listened to of why some things don't work and why we maybe have to do things slightly differently. Um, and not just us, but our assets and our citizens. So the whole co-production um, that, that we're going through at the moment for our to be recommissioned has very much been tell us what we can do differently rather than, you know, a, a general kind of evaluation if that makes sense and it, and it feels yeah. very different yeah i think we behave in a different way and and because we we're kind of we're clear about the values behind what we're doing and a little bit of is the few of us that are in the team we sort of weren't commissioners before so we don't really know how to behave like commissioners so. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of a, yeah so yeah yeah no i agree with that Lovely. <laughs> um, can I can I come to you, Lisa, around terminology? And I think it's a. I'm, I'm sure you've got a, an important question here. We use very specific terminology around citizens, uh, not customers. Um, around um, introductions, not referrals. Around assets, not uh, voluntary organisations. Um, but can you unmute and ask your question? Yeah, I wanted to see if anyone had sort of done what we've done and encountered what we've encountered with it. Because, Tell us more. Um, our community members cannot stand the word citizen or citizenship. Uh, it has very negative connotations to them about the legal status of being a British citizen um, or uh, other groups link it with being a senior citizen. Um, they don't like it, they say it's top-down terminology, it's a legal status. So we talk with the individual groups, you know, how do you want to be referred as? And we get various answers. It's residents, it's community members, it's local residents, it's just people. And I just wanted to see if there was sort of yeah, a consensus on that and other people have encountered that because 
we absolutely, of course, we change our language because we don't want to be top down. That's not what our organisation's about. Um, and if our language isn't right, we adjust it. But then it's almost like we then adjust again when we report back to funders. And it's so frustrating to me that the terminology when I'm promoting a project to a funder isn't the same as the terminology when I'm talking with the people who are designing these projects with us because it's what they want in their backyard. Um, it, and I hate that disconnect. And I just, yeah, wanted other people's sort of input on that, really. I think that's a brilliant challenge um, and um, something which is about listening to the to the voice of people. Matt has got his hand up, so I'll come to him. But Tyber, the, the point about... Um, legal citizenship etc i might come to you because i don't know if it's come up in conversation the hall green given the real diversity of hall green so matthew first though um, i just wanted to say i think you're doing the right thing by listening to people you work with and asking them or well, how do you want to be referred to and uh, and and unfortunately i think you might just have to live with the disconnect you know that and because th there are good reasons we use the term citizen and we've been on an evolution you know and it, you know, if for in Adult Social Care, if you think about, you know, you know how the public sector started, it was very much about patients and about things being done to people. Uh, you know, then it was about service users. So language is really powerful, and it sends a message. You know, so if you're a service user, something, you know, you, you're in quite a passive position, and something's done to you. You know, so the for us, the change of language is quite important, and it reflects like the changes that I explained about a strength-based approach. So citizen, you know, yes, it, it won't work for everyone. It won't work for some people, but there are good reasons we've like ended up settling on that. And we could like spend hours arguing about it. It's just pointless, you know, but just to say it's not a random reason that, you know, adult social care has ended up using citizen most of the time, you know, you know we, we've obviously been through patients, service, you know, clients, service users, and here we are with citizens, you know. So I just thought I'd mention that. Thank you. And has it come up as a discussion in Hall Green at all, Tyber? Um, not really. We have a lot of um, um, groups from BAME communities, European communities, and a lot of the work that um, NNS and our partner colleagues, um, Early Help, do is do a lot of work around citizenship. And we, we have felt that um, using that language has worked for us. Um, and we have been able to connect with people and um, have them connect to us so that we are enabling them to be able to ensure that they are um, receiving the right services, the, the right benefits, the right statuses in whatever area they need support in, especially as now the rules are coming to a change in June. So we, we have actively been doing a lot of work around that. No, thank you. But I think, I think, I think there's a good question there about, about language we use and whether it's inclusive or exclusionary. That's really, really helpful, Lisa. Denise, there's so a couple I, of more. Can I yeah. just add, Denise, uh, you know, pe people in Northfield are more offended that they're classed as an older citizen when they're 50 rather than uh, what we call them. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, um, we, we, we sometimes get, get uh, questioned about the, the word asset as well. Um, that, that, but you know, you are completely right that, that it's definitely something that's important. Yeah, so this may be something we um, we take back to um to to one of our meet, our team meetings and, and look at. There's, as I said, there's a couple more strategic questions that I'll come back to in a second. If I can jump ahead to Emily's question around working with housing associations, because again, I think um, the strongest example of that has been in. Um, Sally Oaken in, in Northfield with um, BVT, Bourneville Village Trust. Is that, that's right, isn't it, Lois? Do you want to, to talk about how they've used, particularly over this uh, lockdown period, how they've used their resources to really work alongside you guys? Yeah, so one of the things we've done in Northfield is created something called the Housing and Communities Pack, which is actually for use um, for um, either housing officers, community engagement, anybody that works within the housing team. Um, we've done quite a lot of work with Bishop um, around sort of attending... That's the Birmingham the Social Housing Partnership, the collaboration of housing associations in Birmingham. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> Brilliant. 
No, thanks. But I, I wouldn't have known the answer to that. So, yeah. <laughs> um, the, what we've also done is encouraged exactly the same as we would with the social workers, um, is for the, um, the housing teams to be using NNS as a resource. So using our, our, our directory, um, we get lots of, of requests coming into the NNS teams from, from housing providers. So, it, you know, I think from, from what I understand for people that have housing stock in, in, in my constituency in particular, that their ability to support um, their tenants has, has been dramatically reduced because of less staff, um, because of changes to the community budget within housing. Um, so what we've basically done is said, look, let us try and take a little bit off that off you, you know, use the services um, within the area, um, whether that be we've got um, a local hoarding charity called Clouds End, um, we've got um, debt and management, ad uh, debt management advice, uh, even helping with things like uh, bidding. But what what we've also started to do is really move into um, housing being an opportunity for people to access support. So um, BVT, for example, if you ring your housing officer at BVT and say I've got no food then they will access the food banks on your behalf, um, you know, and food then be delivered to you. So it doesn't have to be a service that the, the housing teams are offering themselves, but it's just about knowing where to get that support for your citizen, regardless of what it is. Yeah, and thanks for reminding me about that housing pack, because that's, um, again, been a Northfield innovation and it is, it's very comprehensive and it's really helpful. That's a good question, Emily. Thanks. Does that answer it OK for you? Fab. Um, just a couple more questions and then um, maybe very briefly, very brief uh, response maybe from Matthew, which is um, how do we how do we balance the outcomes from listening to people, knowing what the need is with the fact that we only have a finite budget to do this? Other challenges. You're muted, Matthew. Matthew, you're muted. Sorry, I'm used to Teams. Um, yeah, so I think it's a really good question. We are, um, you know, I think the NNS model's got legs. I think it, it can it can do anything. I mean, I think we're learning that the, the ingredients of the model are right. Um, and adult, but adult social care, you know, making the case I mean, Mike uh, Austin, who's now moved on, he did a brilliant job of making the case. And it wasn't easy that we should invest money and that we will see savings, but that the savings are across the system. So what the NNS does will be saving, taking pressure off GPs. It will be taking pressure off housing. Where's their investment? You know, so at some point, other parts of the public sector, if they really want this to grow and if people really like it, they need to start to contribute because it's not a free lunch, you know, uh, you know, we, you have to invest in the voluntary community sector, you have to invest in the lead facilitators that nearly all come from that sector anyway. Um, and, you know, we're confident that you can get great returns, but it's like a whole system approach and everyone operates in silos and, and they all expect, you know, senior managers and finance and stuff, they all want to see precisely how many pounds it's going to save them. You know, but actually it's a whole system thing. You know, we're, we know we're say we're taking pressure off GPs, but we can't prove it. We can't tell you how much, you know, we're taking pressure off hospitals, you know, so, and but it's only us, right? It's only adult social care whose budgets have been massively cut. So yeah, I feel a bit, I get a bit irritated with it. <laughs> Lois, you've got a hand up. One thing that's really fascinated me um, in my time at NNS is that it's actually the, the people on a budget that are sometimes having the most impact. We have something called the micro grants um, pot and um, they're very small grants that might just cover someone's room costs. They might have volunteers um, or it might have even just been we've we've connected uh, a lot with people that work in, in pubs and working men's clubs. Um, where it really highlighted how important that was is at the start of lockdown, because we'd made those connections with the pubs and working men's clubs, the barmaids were ringing us up and saying, 
you know, Fred comes in every Friday for, for his pint and we haven't seen him. We know he doesn't really have any friends or family. Um, you know, is there something we can do? Um, you know, we, we put in things like um, adult safeguarding training in these venues. So it doesn't just have to be these really big, expensive, you know, paid staff um, projects that are supporting citizens. It just means that whoever is having contact with an older person has the knowledge and skills that they need in order to support that citizen if they need it. And that's what NNS is completely about. It's about the community supporting the community. That's brilliant. Um, there was one more question from Naeem in the chat about the benefits of the city council run areas and the voluntary sector run areas. And there hasn't been a, a formal study on that. I think um, one of the strengths of having the neighbourhood De um, support development unit involved is their links already with elected members and it's been so important to have to have links with elected members and and they've 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 got a, 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 that that's easier for them in their areas but they've also been really helpful at connecting helping people connect more locally as well because again local elected members certainly the best of them, but all of them really know what's going on in their areas, know what the needs are, know what the gaps are. And um, the NNS is a strength and when they are involved and around the table. And, uh, and in, um, in Yardley, there's actually been some joint working, going out, door knocking together and things to find out what people think the gaps are. So we have come to the end of our time. I'm sure everyone else has got 12 o'clock things to go to. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Um, for those interesting questions and challenging questions. Um, I won't quite, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it open just for a minute in case anyone wants to shout any questions as other people go. Um, but thank you so much for, for coming and have a good afternoon. <laughs>